This is a difficult lesson for me. I think it can be a difficult lesson for many people. And let me tell you why it's hard for me. Because I like to take my emotion, and when something is difficult inside, I have an inner turmoil I'm thinking about. I like to, I say this to my wife all the time, I just bury it deep down. <laughs> just bury it deep down and, and come back to it later. That's my personality. I have too much to do to worry about those small things. I want to, I want to talk briefly just to introduce this thought of introspection. You know what that means? You know what it means to be introspective? To look inward at oneself and to consider oneself from the inside, the, the secret man, the one that nobody else gets to know. I know my thoughts. God knows my thoughts. I should look inward and examine my thoughts. It is a strange concept. <clears throat> but this is not one that is just in the Bible. Many wise men, or as uh, the world considered them wise, have talked about introspection. You know, Socrates said, My friend, care for your psyche. Know thyself. For once we know ourselves, we may learn how to care for ourselves. <clears throat> Aristotle, he said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. That's what Aristotle said. Now, I don't believe that in ourselves, the way of man is, is not within himself. I don't believe that we have all wisdom built into us. But I do believe that if we are going to take the perfect wisdom that is from above, James chapter 3, we have to be able to look inward at our, at our hearts if we are going to apply this. You have to be able to look introspectively. Consider yourself. Confucius put it this way. When you see a good person, think of becoming like them. When you see someone not so good, reflect on your own weak points. It's very wise. <clears throat> Plato said this, Why should we not calmly and patiently review our own thoughts and thoroughly examine and see what these appearances in us really are? That's a, a wise thing to do. Introspectively look, why am I thinking this? Why am I like this? These are difficult things to do, especially for me, because I like to just bury it deep down. I'll think about it later. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 6. He said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Paul said, do you not know what's inside of you? Do you not know if you're really a Christian? Now, this is a, a rhetorical question. Obviously, you know your inner thoughts. You know the inner workings of your own self. But Paul is saying, why don't you consider that? Why don't you examine what's inside? Why don't you test it? Try yourself. Which brings us to some character studies. Now, these are, these are very hard for people. If, if you identify with one of these uh, animals that we're going to look at, a wolf, a goat, or a sheep, <clears throat> don't bury it deep down. Honestly examine yourself and think, do I resemble this? Are you a wolf? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. We looked at Matthew chapter 6 this morning. Tom did an excellent job. We'll start in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7. Remember, think introspectively. Examine yourself. If you can, one thing that I was told when I was training, when I was training in martial arts, uh, my instructor said, I know they're throwing punches at you. They're coming. They're trying to tackle you to the ground. But what you have to do is you have to step back and think about yourself while this is all happening. 
Can you examine yourself while it's happening? Because you're, you're in a battle. You want to imagine your hands. You want to imagine what's going on. You have to be able to disconnect and look at yourself as if it's somebody else. Verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Let's try to, uh, let's try to apply this. Beware of being a false prophet. That's a good way to start. <clears throat> and putting on sheep's clothing. That's a good way to start. Beware of being that person. Why? We have to step back and, and look at ourselves and say, do I resemble these people? They could know. They know what's inward. He says, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. A little introspection would have helped their situation. It says, you will know them by their fruits. What are some signs of a wolf. The first sign, they pretend to be a sheep, but on the inside, they're ravenous. They look great on the outside. They have the decor. They know what to say. They have flowery speech. But they have an ulterior motive. Their motive is always self-serving. Look at Acts uh, chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. It, it reads, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Who is this about? What does a wolf care about? His next meal. He cares about himself. He doesn't care about the flock. He will draw men away. He will harm individuals in God's church. And it's self-serving. Am I a wolf? Now, inwardly, you would know whether or not you're a wolf. But another sign of a wolf is the consequences of their actions will be made manifest. You will see their fruits. You can pretend to be wonderful, when inwardly you're a wolf, but ultimately your actions will have consequences. A wolf's actions will be made manifest. Do you want to be a wolf? I don't. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to be someone who draws away Christians because of selfish reasons. Uh, doesn't spare any in the flock. Does that sound anything like the life Christ lived? Someone who won't spare someone else? Mercy? Mercy is an important concept. Robert did a great job explaining uh, an object lesson for mercy that you can teach your children when they're young. And we were learning about that this morning. Mercy is so important. Helping Christians, so important. A wolf does not partake in that. Examine yourself. Do you have your own interests in mind above the interests of other people? Are you a wolf? Now that takes some introspection. It, it requires you to look at yourself. That's a difficult thing to do. Because we like to say, well, I might be a little bit, but I'm going to just bury it down and I'll deal with it later. Let's deal with this now while we're looking at these case studies. Are you a wolf? What about a goat? We continue reading in Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? 
cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Not everyone who pretends is going to make it. That's a, that's a difficult thing to hear, isn't it? Well, I think I'm going to make it. We should be sure that we're going to make it. But the only way that you can be sure is by looking inward. Jesus uh, talks about this a little bit more in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. This type of person, this character study that we're looking at, the goats. And it reads, Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered together before him, and he will separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. to sheep. Now skip down to verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left hand, the goat, Depart from me, you cursed, or as he said in uh, Matthew 7, you who practice lawlessness, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. What are some signs of a goat? They pretend to do the will of their father. They put on a good show. You know, Jesus said, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many will say, Did we not... Do these marvelous things. Did I not put on a show for you, God? I put on a show and I I tried to, to, to look good for you. And Jesus is trying to say, you're missing the point. That's not the point of Christianity. The point is not to show up to worship and put on a show. The point is to actually do the acts of compassion. The things we show up here and we worship God from the heart, in spirit and in truth. That's required, not just putting on a good show. Didn't we make a marvelous show of it all, God? And then he says, what about those, what's another uh, sign of a goat? What about those who are in need? A goat doesn't actually help and show compassion to the needy. Oh yes, he'll, he'll act like a Christian. He'll put on the suit and the tie. But when he sees someone who is actually in need, well, I don't, have, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy trying to look good. Trying to, I'm too busy going to worship. This was a problem with the Pharisees at the time. Do you remember? They were all about their law. They even complained to Jesus and he said, what happens if, a, if, a, if an ox falls in the ditch and you're supposed to be worshiping God? You see, their mind was all, it's, it was all backwards. They were missing the point. They were putting on a show when God wanted true worship. He wanted compassion on your fellow man. And they were missing it. Remember that verse, I would have mercy and not sacrifice. There's something better. There's something better and it starts on the inside. It starts with introspection. How do I view the world? How do I view my God? Am I trying to be true to what my God is telling me to do? That's what a goat does. 
They miss the point of practicing Christianity. That's why they say, I've done many wonderful things. Yes, but you haven't done the things, the will of your Father in heaven. You've done what you think is the will of your Father in heaven, but you've neglected the one who has fallen by the wayside, the one who actually needs help. It is a willing, a willing decision to say, no, not going to help you. Am I a wolf? Am I a goat? What happens when I see someone who needs help? Am I going to be a goat? Or am I a sheep? Go back to Matthew chapter 25. Now when Jesus says, not everyone, in verse uh, uh, 20, what is it, 21 of chapter 7, when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven, the implication then is, well, people will enter the kingdom of heaven. So people won't and people will. I want to be the sheep that does enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he's going, to, he's going to clear this up for us so that we can be sure when we look inward, are we this person who he will say, come. Let's read Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, the sheep, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? You notice they're asking the same question. I never saw you. Which one of those people I helped were you? They helped, but they just they were helping people. They, they knew they weren't helping God every single time. Oh, this is actually God that I'm helping. No, they're asking the same question. Where were you in all this that I was doing? Let's continue reading. Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The point is that introspection, looking inward at ourselves, should lead us to treating God's creation like we would treat him. What if Jesus was right in front of you and he needed something? We would scramble. We would do everything we could. This is Jesus. This is the Son of God. Open the house. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus said, come into my home. It's actually Jesus. Let me open the doors. And Why wasn't he doing that before? He needed to see Christ in order to make that connection. And once he had seen Christ, he then went out and helped those who are who were in need. When you look inward, Zacchaeus looked inward. When you look inward at yourself, it should spur you to treat the other people in these pews and the people outside of this building as if they are Christ. As if they are, well, I know it's his creation. I know God made this person. But that takes introspection. It takes an aligning. You look at yourself and you say, this is what God says, and this is where I am. I need to align myself with those things. Now, you cannot do that unless you look inward. You can pretend to do those things. You can put on a show of a few select things that, that look good, but once you look inward, that's when you notice, I'm off. I'm off. And that's why we don't do it. Because it's difficult and, and it's, it's uncomfortable. It's like exercise. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to exercise. But I don't want to do that. I know I'm out of shape. So I'm just going to ignore it because I don't, I don't want to deal with the, the uncomfortableness of it all. In order to get this saying where he says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. You need to look inward. So why should we examine ourselves this way? First, 
because there's a lion. Let's look at 1 Peter 5.8. The writer says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Who does that sound like? A roaring lion seeking to devour? Doesn't that sound like the wolf to you? Do I want to mimic my adversary, the devil? Do I want to walk about like a roaring lion looking to devour, not sparing anyone? That's what the wolf does. Why would I be like, like Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Why would I imitate that? There is a lion. The thing about the lion is the wolves resemble him. But the second thing, why should I look inward? Because there is a lamb. Let's turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 3 through 7. Yes, we have an adversary. He's dangerous. He doesn't spare anyone. He, he walks about seeking whom he may devour, just like the wolf. But what about the lamb in Isaiah 53, 3 through 7? Isaiah is, this is a prophecy of the pain that our Lord would suffer. And he says, he, Jesus, is despised and rejected by men, verse 3. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. John talks about that in John chapter 1. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord... And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yes, there's an adversary going around, but we have one that would take our punishment. One who was more powerful than the ad adversary, and yet his actions showed that he could be a lamb, a sacrificial lamb for us when we needed it most. That's Christ. He is the lamb. In this instance, many people of his time thought they had won. They had defeated Jesus because well, you know, any good leader of a, of a nation, you think about a king or a general, and they were looking for that. They wanted some, somebody to come back and lead them to victory. Who is going to overthrow Rome for us? And what did he do? He kept his, his mouth closed. He was humble. He took our punishment in our stead. Does that sound like a, a warrior that would go forth and conquer? Well, not to them. But when we look at it, we know what he did. He solved the problem like nobody else could. You couldn't take up arms and solve the problem of the divide between man and God. And yet, he became a lamb, and in doing so, he solved the problem. Another depiction of him from this uh, aspect from this vantage point of him being a lamb, is in Revelation chapter 5. Let's turn there. Revelation 5, 11 through 13. Now John writes, and he sees heaven. He's shown something amazing. And he says, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and upon earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard 
I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Yes, he humbled himself. He became a lamb. He was silent when he could have said so many things. And because of that, look where he sits now. He sits on the throne. He has power forever and ever and ever. He could have been a wolf. He could have charged off and attacked, sparing none, all of his enemies. But he didn't do that. He became a sheep for us. What would it take for you to become a sheep? Sometimes we think the best thing to do in this is to just to defeat all my enemies. But we don't know the method. It's, it's a difficult thing. We don't know the method. We think, I'm going to, uh, well, I'm just going to Phineas everybody I see. You know, there was sin in the camp. I'm just going to spear everybody who messes up a little bit. It takes wisdom to see maybe that's not the answer. Maybe the answer is to, to take care of it like a sheep would take care of it. How would, how would a, the Lamb of God handle this situation? Could you be humble? Could you be honest, caring, loving, compassionate? That's what Christ is saying in this instance. Yes, you can be a strong leader, but you have to do it with, with these qualities first and foremost. If you neglect these, we're, we're missing the point. You will be a goat in that situation. Well, I, I, I'm trying my hardest, but I'm trying to put on a show. Don't be a goat. Completely give yourself over. Be a lamb. And that takes sometimes looking at Christ and saying, if he could do it this way, I could do it this way. And in order to do that, you have to look inside of yourself. You have to say, who am I right now? Have I done this? Am I a wolf? Am I a goat? Am I a sheep? We think about these things because when I look at everybody here, I love this congregation. I am not going to stand here and say, I am better than anyone in this congregation. I am a, I'll make a confession here. I make mistakes sometimes. This is the first time my wife is hearing of it. I do make mistakes every once in a while. And I need repentance. I need change in my life. And I need to look inward just like everybody else does. When I present this to you, it's difficult for me to present it because sometimes I feel like it's dishonest for me to present it because I, every time I look inward, I need to make a change. I, I, I need to readjust. I think, well, I can't preach that. How could I preach this when I myself, every time I look inward, and it's painful every time, every time I have to make a change, how am I going to preach this? Because I'm not asking you to be like me. I'm not saying I am a lamb, I am a sheep, I'm the greatest, now, now be me. I wish, honestly, I wish I could say imitate me as I imitate Christ, like Paul said. But sometimes I, I wane and I think, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm there. That's, that's what I think about when I think introspectively. If, is it the right thing for me to say? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to say, think like me. But all I can say from this pulpit is, think like Christ. Look what he does. Take me out of the way for a moment and say, how did Christ do it? I'm going to make mistakes, but I know that my Lord, he didn't make a mistake. He was sinlessly perfect. It's possible to follow in his footsteps. He wouldn't ask anything of us that is too difficult. This morning, or this afternoon, think about which one of these character studies you line up with the most. Ask yourself, do I need prayer moving forward to try to align myself with Christ 
rather than aligning myself with Satan, the adversary, being a wolf. I want to be a lamb. I want to be humble. I want to resemble Christ. That's difficult for me. I'm trying. We all are trying. If you have a need to respond to this message, nobody here is going to look at you and say, oh, ha-ha, we found one of them. We found one in the pack. We weeded out the wrongdoer. No, that's, that's not the point. The point is that only you can do this. Nobody else can look inside and say, I have decided this is what you are. We all need to do this on an individual level, and we all need to help each other. If you are not a Christian, Christ says that you can take hold of Christianity. You can be washed white as snow. You can resemble a perfect lamb. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, he says that he takes the church, Christ takes the church and he presents it to himself holy and without blemish. You can be holy and without blemish. You just have to take hold of Christianity. And you might say, well, I still make mistakes. There is a place to start. Tom did a great job explaining this when he said, uh, sometimes we think, well, I'll, I'll do this when I get my life figured out. Once I get everything turned around, I'll respond to the gospel. No, you have to start. Step one is to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And then you have this family here with you that are going to help you. Revelation 